I, I want to challenge you right away. Um, if, if, if you left, definitely change today. Heal, touch, and minister to. How would, how would your response be right now? What would your attitude be right now? What would your expression be right now? Then, then I want you to think that way. Because that's, that's the merciful Jesus that you serve today. And I'm going to read an opening scripture, and I'll tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to read, give you about um, 12 points today, and I'll introduce what I'm going to talk about. It'll take me about 30 minutes, and then the praise and worship team is going to come back up here, and we're going to get a little brief little testimony, and then we're going to invite people um, to come forward uh, to get prayed for. And like Pastor said, uh, I'm not the healer. Jesus is the healer. I'm just going to do what the Bible says. And the Bible says that we have the authority to lay hands on the sick and to see them recover. I don't believe that I was healed of terminal cancer stage four and given a 50% chance to live one year because I was a pastor. I believe that I was healed because Jesus is a merciful healer, number one. And number two, I understood that I had a right to be healed. And that's often the failure. People don't understand that, that they have a right to be healed. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But Father, thank you for the next few moments of how you're already moving and setting the hearts, and you're going to walk amongst the people. God, even before hands are going to be laid on them, they're going to be receiving their healing, God. It may be legions, it may be gross, it may be tumors, it may be stiffness, it may be pain, throbbing. You're going to just move, oh God. But you're going to do something supernaturally, and we're going to honor you for that because we recognize that you are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, oh God. And you hate suffering. You hate sickness. You hate disease. You hate it so much that you died on the cross and took those 39 stripes, not just for our deliverance of sins, but also to deliver us for sickness. And we thank you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming tonight. In Matthew 9, I'm going to read you an opening scripture. And as we go there, uh, again, I just want to set precedence that in 2008 of June, I was um, diagnosed with um, stage four kidney cancer. had metastasized through my bones, given a 50% chance uh, to l live one year. And um, the reality is, is you, if you do the math, um, 2008 was a long time ago. And the reality is, is that in the last th 13 years, the last 13 years, God is my witness. I've not seen a doctor. I've not had a CAT scan. And I've not had any medication in 13 years. Somebody is, some people would ask the question, don't, don't, you get, don't you go up, don't you get checkups? Well, let me ask you this. When, I, when you're healthy and not in pain, do you just go to the doctor to get a checkup? So I don't need to go to get a checkup. And number two, I'm not in fear that it is going to come back. I believe that a Nahum 1.9, a scripture that many people don't understand, it, it says this, affliction will not rise up a second time. And I believe God, that when, when God heals somebody, it's a final work. Now, we can open the door and allow that thing to come back, but we'll briefly touch on that, but it doesn't have the right, and it doesn't have to come back. So here we are in Matthew, the ninth chapter, and I want to talk a little bit about the myths uh, that Pastor Dennis and, and Lori, I thank God for them opening up their church and allowing this to take place and loving you enough. But he shared a little bit and got caught up in a little bit of not knowing what I was going to preach on. And he said something about a box that people live in. So I want to talk a little bit about the myths, the misconceptions, and the objections that people have in understanding what healing is. Now understand this. I'm not trying to bring any guilt to you. I'm not trying to bring any condemnation your way. I'm just trying to get you to understand that you do have a right to be healed and position you in a place right here, because this is your biggest battle, my biggest battle, right here, right here, right here, right here. And if you can position your mindset to understand certain things that I believe that you're going to be ministered to today, and we're going to have amazing testimonies today. So it reads like this. So he got into a boat, speaking of Jesus, crossed over and came to his own town. Jesus then, just then, some men brought to him a paralytic. 
who was lying on a stretcher, seeing their faith, watch this. First of all, Jesus see, sees what? He sees faith. So we have to ask ourselves, faith can be seen. It's not just simply invisible, it can be seen, okay? And Jesus could see whether we have faith or don't have faith. Jesus uh, sees their faith and he told the paralytic, have courage, your sins are forgiven. So number two, Jesus saw that this man had sins. So you ask yourself, what kind of sins can a paralytic have? He can't go to a strip joint. <laughs> Whatever. But how many of you know there are sins that are in one's heart? There are sins in one's mind that can take place. But Jesus recognized first that this man, he saw the faith of these guys, and he saw also the sin that was in their lives. We'll go on. He says, have courage. At, 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 at this, some of the scribes said to themselves, he is blasphemy, perceiving their thoughts. So Jesus saw the Pharisees' unbelief. So he sees faith, he could see sin, and he saw unbelief. Jesus said, why are you thinking evil things in your hearts? For which is easier, key word easier. What is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk or be healed? But some that, but some that you may know that the Son of Man, so that you can know today that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralytic, get up, take up your stretcher, go home. So he got up and he went home. The question here is this, is it harder for Jesus to do one thing versus another? See, back then during this time, people believed that Jesus could heal bodies. Their struggle was not that Jesus couldn't heal. Their struggle was, could Jesus forgive sins? Because when Jesus said, I forgive sins, he made himself to be God. That's what made these Pharisees so mad, these religious leaders, because they said that's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Fast forward 2,000 years to where we're at today. We do not have a problem that Jesus can forgive our sins. We have a problem that Jesus can heal us. Back then, it was opposite. Oh, he can heal. He can't forgive sin. Today, we say, oh, he could forgive sins. He just can't heal. So with that in mind, I want to briefly go through some objections or myths to break down some things to set our minds free so that we could be in a position to receive healing today. Healing, number one, healing ended, people believe, so many people believe that healing ended with Jesus and the disciples' ministry, and it's not for today. Well, that's a lie. Because the Bible says in Malachi, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And that's what the Bible says. Oh, excuse me, Malachi says, I am the Lord and I change not. And then in Hebrews, it says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So if it was good enough and it was operable enough and his power was released then, did that generation need it more than our generation? Yep. Because here's what you'll read another scripture that says God is not a respecter of persons. He didn't love that generation more than he loves our generation today. The second thing that people struggle with, healing is not the will of God and there's no provision made available for that. Well, if you study the Bible, there are more than 139 verses in the Bible that direct and relate to healing. So why did he write so much in his Bible about healing if it's not for us today and it's not his will? You have to have fa favorite healing scriptures. I had favorite healing scriptures. I'll share a little bit later on a little book that I relied on or, or how I wrote out healing scriptures. But one of my favorite ones is Jeremiah 30, 17. I'll restore to your health and heal your wounds. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. Chastised when our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Said three times in Matthew 8, 17, Isaiah 53, and 1 Peter 2, 24. You have a legal right to be healed. When you understand that sickness and disease is an illegal trespasser that has come into your body, you have a rightful authority under a logistic law called 1 Peter 2, 20. Quote it. It's a law. According to Matthew 8, 17 and Isaiah 53 and you call that out against the enemy who's attacking you and you're standing legally on the word of God. There are about 22 to 23 cases in the Bible of healings. 
He healed the lame. He healed the blind. He healed the mute. He raised the dead. He healed the leper. There are about 22 to 23 cases in the Bible of healing. 22 and 23 cases of healing in the Bible. Of those 22 and of those 23 cases in the Bible, how many of you know or would say, how many of those did Jesus say, it is not my will to heal you? Of those 22 to 23 cases that came up to him, how many of them, he looked at them and said, I can't do it for you. Not today. This isn't a good day for me. I really don't sense power or anointing or gift in me today. I really sympathize with you and I even cry with you, but there's not my, uh, you know, you aren't my favorite today. I just don't like you and so get away from me. I want you to understand Jesus heals some, people believe. Jesus heals some, but he doesn't heal all. It's like a lottery pick. I think you said that, Pastor. It's like you're one of the lucky ones. He sovereignly chooses those that he will heal. And you have nothing to do with the selection of those that will be healed. Some people believe that. Some people absolutely believe that. But there are nine verses I'm going to run through very quickly. If you could show them on the screen. Nine examples here uh, in the Bible where Jesus heals. Where Jesus heals. So can you just, they're all Matthew. I don't know if they're up there. They're Matthew's version. Do you have Matthew? Okay. Okay. So then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed. What is this word? How many are them? How many are them? Okay, I don't know. You're, you're the teachers today. Let's go and look at another verse. Let's look at another verse. Can you give me another verse? Large crowds follow him, and he healed them. Who, how many is them? Who is them? Okay, look, let's go. I don't know. Let's go on. The next verse. Let's try another one. The great multitude came to him, having with them the blame, the blind, the mute, the maimed, and many others, and they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. How many is that? Okay, let's move on. Let's go on. Why is the Bible repeating? And when Jesus landed, landed and saw a large crowd, he healed and had, I mean, he, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. There's the word them again. Next, please go on. Now Jesus began to, began to go all over Galilee, teaching in their synagogue, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every, oh, okay, here's another word now. Come on. Every. How many diseases are in every? All. Is it limited what every is? No. Could it be, could, could it be at lupus? Yeah. Could it be a brain tumor? Could it be cancer? Could it be arthritis? Could it be cerebral palsy? Could it be Parkinson's? Well, let's go on. I don't know. Let's see. And it says, and when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and he, he okay, wait a minute. Well, it's God's will, but you may not be the one he's choosing. And he picks and chooses. Well, it doesn't say that here. Where did that come up? Where did you come up with that? Where does church come up with that? Where do people, it says he healed how many? All. What is all? Is is that like 90%? Is that 50%? Is that 10%? What is all? Oh, you're pretty smart. Can we go on one, maybe another one? Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogue, preaching the gospel, the kingdom of God, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. I don't know if there's another, but you're going to, is there? Oh, you got another, look at this. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there, and a great multitude followed him, and he healed them all. How many of you choose want to be, want to be part of the thems? How many of you want to choose to be part of the alls? I showed you in the Bible what happened there. I want you to recognize our participation of action, some believe, and response of faith has nothing to do with healing. Yes, it does. Your faith has everything to do with healing. It's not my faith alone. It's your faith, too that has something to do with it. I believe some people can lose their healing because the faith of the person that's praying for them is, is God is honoring that, but that person doesn't release their faith, and so they go back to a lifestyle of non-faith, and they can lose their faith. 
That's why when Jairus' daughter was healed, he put out all the spectators and doubters, but he asked Jairus and Mrs. Jairus to come into the house. It was their faith and God's faith that would touch each other and cause that child to be healed. So your faith does have something uh, to do with receiving healing. Uh, of again, the 22 to 23 uh, cases of healing. Here's something to understand. 78% of those healing required something of the individual, where only 22% of the healings were done sovereignly, which means they had nothing to do with the healing. For an example, he, Jesus healed at Malchus's ear when Peter cut it off. He didn't look at Malchus and say, do you believe that I'm your personal Lord and Savior? Do you believe that I ha you, do you have faith for me to heal you? I need you to confess your sins before me and then I'll heal you. No, he just, he just healed him. Peter's mother-in-law, he didn't ask her anything when she had the fever, he just healed her. What I'm trying to say is, is that you go to the other side of 78% of people that were healed, you will see the woman with the issue of blood used her faith and pressed through the crowd and touched the hem of his garment. Blind Bartimaeus kept shouting out when everybody told him to shut up, son of David, have mercy upon me, heal me. The, poor, the four friends with the paralytic that we read had to break through the roof when the window was closed and the door was closed and a persistence to get to Jesus to see uh, faith. When the lepers were healed, he said, go show yourself to a priest and offer up a gift so your faith has something to do with it. Healing manifestations are always instant so you'll know if you got it or not. No, that's not true. The Bible says we'll lay hands on the sick and see them recover. And the blind man from Bethsaida, Jesus spit and he laid his hands on him and he asked him if he saw. And he said, I, 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 see, I see, but it's very, very blurry. It's not complete. And Jesus laid his hands on him a second time, which is indicating a process that takes place sometimes and a recovery of time that takes place sometime. But people get so discouraged when it sometimes doesn't happen instantly. It may tonight, and it may not happen, but I'm going to believe that everybody's going to get healed. Jesus can use different things and methods and paths to bring about your healing. Absolutely true. He can. Absolutely. I'm going to turn to a couple of scriptures. I'm going to ask them to help me. Isaiah, if you could turn to the Isaiah 38 scripture. It said, now Isaiah had said, let them take a lump of figs and apply it as a polis on the boil and he shall recover. The prophet Isaiah had come to King Hezekiah and said, set your house in order. You have a fatal terminal disease and you are going to die. He repented, cried out. He was, God was merciful. And he came back and he told him, you're going to live and you're going to live 15 more years. But after that, he gave him an antidote. He gave him a remedy to deal with this lump, this legion, this bump, this thing that was terminal within him. He told him to go get figs. So there are many methods in which God can use to heal of somebody. He can use surgery. He could use medication. He could use natural remedies. He could use sleep, exercise, diet, communion, confession of God's word, scripture. He could use rebuking and casting down imaginations, rebuking the enemy. But all those things are amazing. Proverbs 18, 9, this scripture blew me away during, my, during the time of affliction because it read this way. And I'm only going to read the, the B verse here. And he who does not use his endeavors to heal himself is a brother to him who commits suicide. Wow. See, when you say, I'm only going to do this and I'm not going to do that, then you might be, he's saying, committing suicide. Take advantage of every endeavor that God makes available to you. Take stewardship over your health. Take responsibility to do what God asks you to do rather than limiting and saying, no, I'm stubborn and I'm not going to do it that way. We're moving really good through this. After healing, nothing is required of you to change or be different so you can return back to your bad habits. No, <laughs> that, that's absolutely not true. When he healed that blind man and took him out of Bethsaida, he told him, go to your, back to your house, but don't go back to Bethsaida, the town. Something in Bethsaida would rob him of, of his healing. And again, when the leper was healed, he told him, go sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. 
So you and I have to recognize that we have to be a steward over our health and guard ourselves against the vulnerability that we have maybe opened ourselves up to. See, because a lot of people want to deal, they want to deal with the symptoms of the disease. They don't want to think about the cause of the disease. Okay? And when God may reveal to you uh, the cause of how this happened, but many people, I just want this gone. But if you don't have a change in lifestyle, and maybe your lifestyle created an open door where the enemy could come in and steal your health, then the enemy's going to keep coming back in that area. So you have to understand how to steward the health. And I had to learn that lesson. I had to learn that lesson about how uh, worry and stress and a workaholic and internalizing everything began to break down my immune system. My diet was shot. It was poor. I didn't drink water. I hardly ate any vegetables, hardly any fruit. I ate a lot of, ate a lot of processed foods. So you add all this mixture a bad diet and stress and doesn't sleep well and overworks and it will run down your immune system. And it will create an open door for the enemy to attack. And that's the level of understanding I needed. If I got instantly healed, I would not have understood that revelation. But it took me a process of time, about four years, before I felt like I was 100% back to my strength level before the affliction took place. And in that process, it was peeling an onion and God revealing the toxic lifestyle that I have. I, I was a Christian and I was a pastor, but I had some imbalances. Is that okay to say that? I just had some imbalances that, that were in my life taking place. The more you suffer, beg, cry, pray, yell, is what Jesus will respond to and qualify you for your healing. No, that's absolutely untrue. Isaiah 56 and verse number nine, one of my favorite verses says says this. Isaiah 56, 56 says, the very day I call for help, the tide of the battle turns. It's one thing I know, God is for me. The very moment you pray and ask God for your healing, God goes to work things begin to to turn. It's just you have to, again, I told you, one of the biggest things that we fight against is not a physical battle. We think it's a physical battle, sickness and disease, ailment, illness, uh, diagnosis, prognosis, but the biggest thing is right here. And I believe that people lose hope. That's why the Bible says the soul, the mind, uh, it's an anchor. It's an anchor to you. It keeps you from drifting. And that's why the scriptures are so important to renew your mind and hear the word of God to build your faith in that particular level. The enemy's wicked. He'll bombard your mind. He'll throw wicked thoughts. He'll show you, an, I, I've got him. He'll show you a picture of you in the hospice. He'll give you a picture of your family laying over your dead body. He'll show you the funeral. He'll just lie to you and tell you, just give up, quit. Who do you think you are receiving your healing? You know, nobody gets healing Nobody receives it. This thing is terminal. And all those are lies, and you've got to be able to take authority over those thoughts because you heard something. You heard what the doctor said. You saw something with these eyes. You saw the CAT scan. And you have to learn how to deprogram. That's not easy. I got to deprogram what this thing doesn't want me to let go of. And the only way to do it is not self-will and self-power. It's the power found in God's word that I've got to meditate in. And I've got to read that as the final authority over my life. Thank God for the doctor. But the doctor is not my final authority. And again, it's gaining that understanding. And it's beginning to break the shackles that sometimes bind us. In our lives, Jesus, somebody believes Jesus is trying to teach you something, a lesson. That's why the affliction has come. Some people literally believe that. But the reality is this. Jesus doesn't partner with the devil to afflict you. Number two, Jesus doesn't put on you things that he paid for on the cross. And James says every good and every perfect gift comes from above. Last time I looked at it, my sickness and that cancer is not a good and perfect gift. I don't care what you say. And then in Luke 18, the woman that was bent over for 13 years, Jesus clearly says whom Satan had bound. Satan made that happen. He attacked her and caused her to be afflicted. So enemy is the source. Someone says this, I know somebody, we're getting winding this up, I know someone who confessed and prayed and believed and asked for their healing and they didn't get it. What about them? And what makes me think that I'll receive my healing? This is huge in people's life. 
A lot of, lot of, lot of uh, weight that this point carries in that. I said to you in Acts 10.35 that God is not a respecter of persons, number one. The second thing I want to share along this point is the fact that you don't know it all. So don't try to figure it out. I've been around great Christians, and again, uh, to be in heaven is a reward. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But, it, but if one chooses to want to live and fight and, and believe God, he, he has a right to do it. But so many people will go around them and say, you know what, I'm, I'm believing and I'm asking God for my healing. And then 10 minutes later, they'll just say, but if I don't make it, I just want you to tell my, everyone I love them. And so they're, they're a double-minded going backwards and forwards. I've had people say me because I'm a preacher. I guess they're supposed to or feel obligated to say they're believing God. But then when they're with their friends or their family, they, they, they want to go to heaven. They say, I'm just tired. I, I'm ready to go. I want to meet my loved one. And so, you know, there's that that goes on in, in people. So, but that now you and I get involved and say God's not a healer because that Christian was praying and believing for their healing and they never got their healing and went to heaven so it affects my faith now. How many of you have ever watched an athletic program? Let's just say baseball. We can all, baseball. A guy rounds 30, slides in home, slides into home plate. And the referee says, safe. And you say, no way is that guy safe. He's out. And you're yelling because I saw it with my eyes. And then they do a replay in slow motion on the jumbotron, and now you see the umpire made the right call, he was safe. See, you had a wrong perspective from the distance where you were seated. Jesus is right in front of the person, and he always makes the right call. So don't get your opinion in between God, because that's what the enemy wants. He wants you to question the integrity of God. Question the integrity of God. And that's what he did in the Garden of Eden, question the integrity of God. That's what he tried to do in the wilderness with Jesus, question the integrity of God. And the enemy still does uh, that, that same trick. Let me just give you two more points and we're done. Sometimes we can be more massive. Praise and worship team to begin to move on up here and we're gonna prepare. Sometimes we can be more devoted and disciplined and de dedicated and have more faith in our doctor and our medications and our prescriptions than we do spiritual disciplines. The Bible says, my son, attend to my words, incline thy ears unto thy sayings, let them not depart from thy eyes, keep them in the midst of thy heart, for they are life. The word is life unto those that find them. The word of God is life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. In one translation it says, the word of God is medicine. I know that we are so dedicated. Oh, my appointment today is at 11 o'clock for the doctor. I can't miss it. I want to be early. I want to sit there in the, the lobby. and just, I don't mean to make fun, but that's how. What time is it? It's time for my medication. Don't let me miss my medication. What about the word of God? Who gives a care? What about the scriptures that you're going to, I don't know. It's a hit man. We're more dedicated. And again, this message is not to bring any condemnation. It's just to reveal stuff to us today. Yeah. Let me show you what I mean as I, as I wind this down. Could you just show my images of this little book that I sent you? Those pictures of a book. Okay. So here's what happened. Days after I was diagnosed, I was just like everyone else. I was 47 years old. I'd run seven marathons in the last two years. I'd run the, the, the Boston Marathon and qualified for the most prestigious marathon on the planet. I'd run a marathon three months before I walked into that doctor's office. There is no way that I have terminal cancer. But that's what I heard. And they told me how long I would live. And they looked at me and said this to me, do not make any long-term decisions. I don't even know what you mean. I can't buy a dog because I'm not going to be around long enough to see the dog. I can't buy a car. I can't buy. That's what they were telling me. You can't buy a house. You can't buy no long-term commitment because you're not going to be around. You're not going to do that. I was overwhelmed. My wife was right there. I cried. From the moment I walked out of that doctor's office to my car, we could not go home because I couldn't stop crying. Because not only was it sorrow, it was fear. I was overwhelmed. 
My life is going to end at 47 years old. I'm not going to see my children married. I'm not going to see my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. And the list could go on. So I said, in the next couple days, I, what do I do now? Where, where, where do I go from here? And I felt like the God said, I, I want you to read every scripture in the Bible concerning healing. And that's going to be your medicine. And as dedicated as you would be to natural, that's what I expect of you to be dedicated. In four years, in four years, in less than this palm hand, did I miss reading 175 scriptures that would take me 20 minutes to read and then 10 minutes I pray over my body from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. I go something like this. My hair is healed. My scalp is healed. My eyebrows are healed. My skin is healed. My tongue is healed. My nose is healed. My lips are healed. My gums are healed. My teeth are I just work through my whole body. That would take me another 10 minutes to do that. But I did it for four years. But here's what happened. I was reading this book by John Hagee. It doesn't matter what the book is. When God told me to write out all these scriptures. I just, it, I didn't go get a notepad. I didn't, I just got this book and I just started writing the scriptures that I was thinking about. So I just, who cares? But look at how tattered it is. Cause I lived in this book. I cried over this book. I wept over this book. This became my lifeline, the Word of God, not, not this book, the scriptures from the Word of God that I wrote that were God personally, I believe, God wrote those scriptures for you, but he wrote those scriptures for me, and they became my scriptures, my promises that God would give me. I think I want to end. Sometimes we could be more devoted than we are to the things of God. I think I need to end with this one. A sickness and a disease can be connected to the condition of your soul and your spirit. So sometimes where there's negative emotions such as fear, worry, sin, unforgiveness, anger, grief, anxiety, it can affect and hinder your healing. I end with this scripture in Job. Job was afflicted, the Bible says. For a period of time. But it says, Alphanaz, the Timnanite, Bildad, the Shumite, Zophar, the Namanite, went and did as the Lord commanded them. For the Lord had accepted Job, and the Lord restored. You could put their heel, because that's what happened. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he did what? When he prayed for his friends. And if you read the story, they backstabbed him, they betrayed on him, they lied on him, and there was a place in his life that he was filled with bitterness and unforgiveness and anger. And God could not heal him until he let go of that. And when he prayed forgiveness for his friends or toward his friends, God said, now I can heal you. And one of the biggest things that's stopping people is a negative emotion that you're carrying. Anger towards somebody, unresolved issues with your daddy, forgiveness issues, worry, anxiety, gr grief, you're still sorrowing and stressing over a loss and pain in your life. I end with this story. In the early 1900s, there was a man traveling from Europe to America. He was waiting to get on the passenger ship that would sail him from Europe to America. The passenger ship overbooked and they apologized. And they said to him, we've overbooked on the passenger ship, but I want you to recognize we own a cruise ship line. And we are going to put you on the cruise ship line. You'll still get to America in the same time. You'll just travel on a cruise ship. So as he gets to America in New York, he's boarding, and all the people on the ship are saying, thank you for traveling with us. I hope you had a good stay. All the, all the crew is welcoming, welcoming, thanking you, thanking you. And the man walks off, and the man, they look at them and say, I hope you had a wonderful uh, uh, experience on our ship. He said, I did. I hope the accommodations were wonderful. Yes, they were. I'm glad we were able to accommodate you. He's, then they said, how, how did you enjoy the buffet? He said, what buffet? They said, he said, how did you enjoy the pool? He said, what pool? How did you enjoy the gymnasium? What gymnasium? How did you enjoy the entertainment? 
He said, I didn't. Uh, he said, I just stayed in my room the whole trip. I didn't know that that came with the price of the ticket. I didn't know that that came with the price of the ticket. The ticket is Jesus purchasing your sickness and disease on a cross. And you can live beneath your privileges as you, if you want, or you could take advantage of every benefit that Christ has for you. Can we give the Lord a clap offering today? Very quickly, Maggie, would you please come up here? I'd like to introduce to you a friend. Her name is Maggie. Can we give Maggie a hand? Thank you, Maggie. You have a mic or, or we have, there we go. Thank you. Thank you so much. We want to hear your voice, Maggie. So um, Maggie, uh, a year ago this time when we had a healing service, you were here. Can you tell us where you were a year ago in your life? Yes. It's on. Okay. Um, yeah, a year ago, um, exactly a year ago, it was January 8th on the Sunday, um, I had gone through, I honestly, I told Pastor Deeg, I didn't know where to start, but a, a year ago last, um, on this, the 8th of January, I was invited by a friend, a very dear friend, to come to a healing service, but where I was at, was in a place of struggling um, with an addiction to alcohol. I was born and raised a Christian. I've lived a Christian life my whole life. Jesus has always been with me. But at that, through the years, through my, I could start from my dad dying at um, getting cancer at age 17. Uh, he died when I was 19. Um, hardships like that. My sister was killed in a tragic accident at age 44. Um, I had a number of sequences, so things build up. We as Christians, we all go through stuff. Just because we're Christians, we're, we go through stuff too. But we have the love of Jesus in us, and we have um, the hope of Christ. And I've always had that. But when I came uh, a year ago, I had all that faith. I'd been struggling myself, knew that I had God, mean God could do this. Um, but I continued to go through a struggle with it. And coming here, even though I could say the prayer of faith and believe that Jesus would heal me, there was something special in, this, in these walls last year. And um, that's the power of Jesus at his timing. I think he wanted me to go through a few things, maybe to be uh, more of an example or to be able to have a witness to know that God can do mighty and great things. Um, and he showed that to me. But the great thing is, you say the prayer of faith, and I believe that. But then after that, it is going out and thanking him with every prayer. And every prayer following is a prayer of gratitude and thankfulness and believing. Because I believed in that prayer. From that experience of what Pastor Diego shared, it was your words that you spoke. It was obviously anointed and meant something to me. But I was surrounded by people that all um, were affected in a different way, and we all have different things as you listed off. Um, I was healed from two things. I also had a disease that was supposed to be lifelong. Um, it was psoriatic arthritis. It was um, moderate to severe. It was supposed to be for my whole life. I went through a hard time with it. I was covered head to toe with um, skin. I couldn't leave the house kind of thing, but that's where it was an obvious physical healing and I still am healed from that and will continue. And I know Jesus did it that night. So, so thankful. So thankful. Thank you. Let's give a hand for Maggie. I believe that God can do the same thing for you. God's not a respecter of persons. And whether you need to be healed in your spirit, your mind, or your body, I believe God will do that. And whether it is arthritis or a drug addiction or alcoholism, it doesn't matter to God. He's a merciful healer. So here's what we're gonna do. They're gonna play just a little bit and sing just a little bit to prepare our hearts to receive. And now I'm gonna invite people who, who genuinely need a healing in their bodies. 
Uh, I believe the ushers are going to help us. I believe they're going to go in from the overflow room or, if, or whatever to bring them forward. Just follow the direction of the ushers. Again, I, I don't have any power. Uh, I, I'm just going to do what the Bible tells me to do, to lay hands on the sick. And I believe that the point of contact where faith is released, something is going to happen. Now, for some of you, you may feel something. For some of you, there may be a reaction to something. For some of you, you be, if you can, you'll begin to check yourself and see if something has been taken care of. For some of you, you will sleep like a baby tonight and wake up and just know that I know that I know that I am healed. And you will continue to do what you're doing, but you'll go back to the doctor and they'll say, what the heck happened to you? We can't find anything because eventually I went and got a last CAT scan and they said, where is it all? Where is it? And it was all gone. And that's why I never went back because it, the CAT scan had revealed it and uh, it, it was a true miracle. And that will happen for you today. So I'm just going to ask wherever you are to begin to move forward today. And I am just simply, if they, I can, I didn't ask for some, get some anointing oil. Because the Bible says that lay hands, the prayer of faith, as we anoint with oil, will save the sick. I'm just going to touch you. That's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to touch you. I'm going to pray a general prayer over everybody, over everybody. And then I'm going to touch you. And I believe the power of God will hit that sickness and hit that disease and break the spirit of infirmity off of you today, and you're gonna leave this place healed and delivered, and that affliction will not come back again in the name of Jesus. And tumors and growths and legions will begin to wither away, and they will begin to shrink, and they will begin to dissipate, and things that are not working are gonna to begin to work in your body in the name of Jesus. Let's worship the Lord just for a few moments. Merciful healer. Merciful healer. And the moment I, I touch you, 
uh, you just believe that God is healing you, and then you go go back to your seat to allow the next row of people to come forward. Can you do that? We're gonna, I'm going to pray. Then once I touch you, you're going to thank God. You're going to go back thanking God for your healing. That's what you're going to say, and that's what you'll say for the next few days. Thank you, Jesus, for healing me. Thank you, Jesus, I received my healing. Thank you, Lord, for my healing. And then allow the next row of people to come forward. Father, I bring your people before you now in the name of Jesus. I don't know the condition. I don't know the symptoms. I don't know the diagnosis nor the prognosis, but you do, God. This may have caught them unexpectedly, but it did not catch you unexpectedly. Because 2,000 years ago, you paid the price for them to be healed today. So we have and they have a right to be healed. So I remind the devil of what the Word says. And the Word is a legal law that says that you are a trespasser. So you felt tormented disease. You felt oppressive sickness. You spirit of infirmity. We rebuke you now. We negate your power. And we terminate and extinguish. You are a trespasser. You are illegal. And you are now caught. And you must leave in the name of Jesus. And I command you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, spirit, soul, and body to be healed, to be made whole, and to be delivered by the power that's in the name of Jesus. Be healed. Receive your healing. Be healed. Receive your healing. In Jesus' name, be healed. Be healed. In the name of Jesus, we count, we speak healing over you. We speak life to you now. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed. Receive your healing. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. God, I thank you for healing. Everybody at this altar, God. Thank you for the testimonies. Thank you for the stories, God. Thank you, Lord. They're going to live and not die. And declare the glory of the Lord, Lord. I thank you for that now. In the name of Jesus, I thank you for touching everyone at this altar, God. In Jesus' name, be healed. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. 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 Name of Jesus. By the power and by the authority that's in the name of Jesus release healing. We thank you, God, that you are a healer. The life of God flows in these bodies now, God, eradicating sickness and disease in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank 
you. Thank you for paying the price for these people's healing now. You purchased it, Lord. You paid for it, God. Thank you, Lord. You took it upon yourself. You took all the suffering, all the sickness, all the disease, all the pain on you, O oh God, by the stripes of Jesus, by the stripes of Jesus, by the stripes of Jesus, by the stripes of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for healing. Thank you, Father. Your healing touch, your healing touch. Let it flow, God. Let your power flow, God. Let your glory flow. Thank you, Lord. Lord, let it flow into their bodies now, Lord. Every cell, every tissue, every organ, every blood vessel, every bone, every muscle, your DNA, the cells of your body, your immune system, in the name of Jesus, the tissues of your body, the organs of your body, be healed now by the stripes of Jesus. Everything that's terminal must not anymore be terminal. I beg you, recovery is taking place, oh God. We curse cancer. We curse lupus. We curse Parkinson's. We curse arthritis. We curse all forms of sicknesses and diseases. Every diagnosis, God.
together and just thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. I believe with all my heart, the testimonies and the stories will start being told and will start being heard. And you're going to experience tremendous victory in your health. And again, I remind you that when you leave this place, all that you need to be saying is, Lord, thank you for my healing. That's your commission. That's your work. That's your job. Just be saying, Lord, I thank you for my healing. Amen? Come on, let's thank him one more time.